Hi, welcome to Exploring the World Ocean. I'm Sean Chamberlain. Today we're going to talk about the ocean and the atmosphere. In particular, we're going to look at the interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere. As you can see in the image behind me, an image of Hurricane Katrina, the interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere can produce some pretty startling and dangerous results. But the interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere are also of utmost concern to us humans here on planet Earth. The interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere control Earth's climate. They provide the oxygen we breathe and distribute that oxygen. They heat up our planet and transfer heat around our planet and also are important in the making of food in the ocean. So let's take a look at some of the questions that people studying the ocean and the atmosphere take a look at. <clears throat> we want to know how do the ocean and atmosphere interact to exchange energy and matter? What are the patterns of circulation of the atmosphere? And in our next chapter, we'll talk about how those patterns of the circulation of the atmosphere affect the circulation of the ocean. What are the global patterns of temperature and salinity in the world ocean that result from those interactions with the atmosphere and the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere? And we'll take a look at some of the climate interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere. In particular, the phenomenon of El Nino which, and La Nina, of course, which happen every few years in the equatorial Pacific and, of course, those ever-present and dangerous hurricanes. Well, of course, again, like many topics in oceanography, we're concerned here as well and want to re-emphasize the importance of scales of time and scales of space. In terms of time, we are fam very familiar with the weather, which is what's happening out right now. The kinds of things going on in the atmosphere on a second by second or minute by minute basis. Well, the ocean has weather too. But if we take those scales of time further out, we begin to uh, explore things like seasons. We start thing exploring things like El Nino and La Nina. Even further out, we explore things like changes in ocean temperatures over 20 and 30 year scales and changes in the intensity of hurricanes over those kinds of scales. And of course, climate change and ice ages and all those kinds of things are happening over different time scales in both the ocean and the atmosphere. So we'll take a little bit of a look at that. As well, the interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere can be very regionalized or specific. The kinds of things going on in one location in the ocean actually may turn out to affect things that are going on in other locations in the ocean. And the same thing is true in the atmosphere. Tropical circulation is different than polar circulation, but all of it is interconnected. And so we want to keep in mind how processes change over time and space to give us some idea of the scales of types of things that oceanographers and meteorologists study. Remember, if you look in figure 1-1, one -one, the fold-out map on the inside front cover of your book, actually it's just printed right on the front cover of your book, it will give you some sense of, again, the kinds of processes that change from seconds to centuries and from little tiny scales of space to kilometers and thousands of kilometers. <clears throat> Well, let's start with a few definitions, and this is one I just kind of alluded to. Weather is defined as the day-to-day -day fluctuations in atmospheric or oceanic conditions. And yes, the ocean does have weather. Weather is what's happening right now, and we'll look at a few examples of that in just a minute. Climate, however, on the other term, is the average of weather conditions for a particular location and also over a given span of time. And these are really two important distinctions because people often confuse the difference between weather and climate, particularly in discussions about global climate change. So we'll talk about that in a few more detail, in a little bit more detail in just a minute. We also can use this average of climate, which may average a few days, weeks, months, years, decades, centuries, millennia, we can use those to define climate regions, and these climate regions can be very important for human activities, as we'll see in just a minute. Well, here's some examples of weather, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with cloudy weather, lightning, hailstorms, snowy weather, 
tornadoes. We don't get too many of those here in Southern California, but on occasion we get tornadoes. Beautiful, clear, mountain-type weather. Foggy, marine-type weather. Even waves are a form of weather. And of course, what's going on inside the ocean? Not the dolphin, but the green color of the water, the sort of opaque coloration is a type of weather in the same way that fog is a type of weather for a coastal environment. <clears throat> we can use the average of weather, so the long-term average of the kinds of atmospheric and also oceanic conditions in a given region to define what are called climate regions or a climate classification system. And there's lots of different climate classification systems you might find if you browse through a meteorology book or check it out on the uh, internet. But the important thing to remember is that these are broad classifications and people's classifications might change. But the important thing to remember is that these are long-term averages of what it's like in a region. And they provide very useful information. If, for example, we take a look at this map, figure 8-1 in our book, we can see that generally along the tropics, well, it's warm. We call that an equatorial climate region. In along mountain regions, along the west coast of South America, and of course the west coast of the United States, including Alaska and Canada as well, those are mountain climates. Now let's say, for example, that you were, had invented some kind of new snowboard or some kind of uh, new boot for a set of skis or something that had to do with cold weather. You probably wouldn't want to market it to people that live in equatorial climates. So looking at a weather map like this, in essence, defines who your customers are on a business sense. So climate maps, even though you're learning about it in a science class, can be useful to businesses as well. On the same token, if you were looking to retire somewhere where it was nice and warm and sunny most of the time, or perhaps even dry, you'd pick one of these areas to live in. So climate information, even though we may not realize it on a day-to-day -day basis, it really governs our lives in terms of the kinds of clothes we buy and wear, in terms of the kinds of cars we drive, and kinds of the things that we in the in the kinds of things that we do really throughout the seasons and it may even govern where we decide to retire and those kinds of things. It may govern business decisions. So an awareness of climate and attention to climate conditions in different parts of the world is really important to us for lots of different reasons. <clears throat> well, this figure is really just meant to kind of give you an overview of the different kinds of interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere. And by no means is this the kind of thing that I would ask you about on a test or ask you to really begin to um, discuss back, talk back to me about, but it does give you some sense of the many different ways that the ocean and the atmosphere interact with each other. And some of these we've already taken a look at. We looked at the penetration of light through the ocean. Of course, that's an interaction between atmospheric, really, uh, outer space and atmospheric and oceanic processes. We've looked at evaporation and precipitation. We talked a little bit about sea ice and sensible heat, as well as latent heat transfer. We will talk a little bit more in this chapter and in, uh, when we get to waves about the effects of winds on the surface of the ocean. Really one of the more well-known and, and probably the, the kind of interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere that's most visible or most obvious to us, the wind blowing over the surface of the ocean. Of course, the exchanges that go on with gases, with phytoplankton taking up carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen, and those gases being transferred across the air-sea interface. Of course, that's another important interaction between the ocean and atmosphere as well. So all these different things and many, many more are interactions that happen as a result of atmospheric processes and as a result of oceanic processes and in total, they govern our climate, they govern the composition of our atmosphere, and they also govern the productivity of the ocean. So they're pretty important.